Hi, and welcome to our podcast and PBL webinar. Uh, for those of you joining us live, uh, thanks for jumping in. For those of you who are watching this uh, recording on our YouTube channel, thanks for taking the time to, uh, to access this resource. So all of the slides from today are actually at the uh, bottom right there at the access slides where it says that bit.ly link. So at any point, if you just want to type in uh, bit.ly slash ETT PBL podcast, uh, you'll be able to access all of the resources for today. All right, I'm just gonna take one more second to get my bearings here. All right, so we are ready to go. Um, quick introduction, my name is Tom Driscoll. I am an instructor for EdTech Teacher. Uh, we've been running a series of back to school webinars. We're probably gonna run a series of these at different points throughout the year. I've been working with EdTech Teacher for about five or six years now. Uh, prior to working full-time with EdTech Teacher, I was a digital learning director uh, for a regional school district in Rhode Island. Before that, I was a high school social studies teacher for two different public school districts in Connecticut. So uh, my contact information is at the top right. Uh, so I'm at uh, social media at Tom Driscoll EDU on, on all the different platforms there. Uh, Driscoll at EdTech Teacher if you want to reach out at any time after this workshop. Uh, and TomDriscollEDU.com is my website. All right, so as far as this particular workshop, it's a quick, um, relatively fast paced webinar. And it may seem like it goes pretty fast uh, as far as going through the content and the resources. But as I mentioned, we do have that bit.ly link with all of the resources linked in here that you guys can access. You can reach out to me after if you have any questions. And also uh, we'll be posting this video on our YouTube channel for viewing later and for sharing out with some of your colleagues. As far as the content of today, we're going to take a look at two different themes, but uh, taking a closer look at how they work well together. And that's the idea of audio and podcasting, but marrying that with the concept of PBL or project-based learning. And as we go through the first part of the session, it's really kind of the what and why behind each. And then I really dive into the how. So particularly when it comes to the podcasting, how could you get up and running in your classroom? What are some examples? What does it look like in the context of teaching? And what are some of the software and hardware tools that make it um, scalable and practical for you in the classroom? So uh, the beginning's a little bit heavier on the theory and the practice behind it. And second's more of like the how-to. So that's kind of how we're going to organize this. At the end of the session, uh, so I am gonna take any questions. So if you guys stick around, uh, or if you just wanna add some things to the chat as I go through, we'll have a little bit of a Q&A towards the end if you guys have anything you would like to ask. All right, so first, just so we have a, a, the context here around PBL. Most people have heard of PBL before, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page here, uh, essentially project-based learning is a teaching method in which students gain knowledge and skills by working for an extended period of time to investigate and respond to an authentic, engaging, and complex question, problem, or challenge. So this definition comes from PBL Works. You're probably familiar with some of their work. Uh, and is derived for the most part out of the Buck Institute. But just a couple things to point out. Um, there is a difference between a project uh, or a PBL and a project. And we'll get into that a little bit more specifically in a second. But this uh, breaks down some of the more specific components of a good high quality PBL unit. So the ones that we're going to focus on today particularly are the idea of authenticity and public product. Uh, but some other things that make it really well, uh, really well done are you have students collaborating throughout, you have project management uh, resources uh, designed for students to help scaffold instruction and help support them through the project. Um, it's not just a project that you just throw at the end of the unit, and we'll talk about that in a second as well. Uh, and there's also a lot of opportunities for reflection. If you're interested in the full uh, HQPBL framework, it is linked in the slide deck. But for the most part, those are uh, the key components that we like to focus on. Now, this is a nice visual from New Tech Network. And what I, I like about this is it helps kind of dispel the myth of PBL is just doing a project. And when I first started teaching, I taught in a very traditional way uh, where, I, like many of us, we, I kind of taught how I was taught, right? And I would start out when I was a social studies teacher, I would do my lectures and I'd have activities. I'd do another lecture, another activity, a quiz, then I'd review for a big exam. And then after the test, I'd carve out a few days for a project in which they applied what they learned. Now, there's nothing wrong with that setup, right? And a lot of people that get into PBL start here. Uh, but if you think about a full-blown PBL unit, 
It's really more about starting the unit with the project. And you still do activities and lectures and, and all of the things you normally would, but you layer that into the actual project. So they're continually working on this project throughout, and then they have some type of culminating event at the end. Right. So that's the difference is that the, the I guess, quote unquote, traditional approach is you learn all of this stuff and then you apply it with a project. PBL is more you're learning the stuff through the project. Right. So that's the main you know, difference, I think, between these two different approaches and teachers around the country have been doing PBL for years. So we don't need to go too deep into the why you would do this, but this is typically how you would set this up. All right. So now to the point of our webinar today. So if you are doing PBL. How can you integrate podcasting into those projects? And I think it works uh, together with PBL in a few different ways. First, I've, and we're not going to focus too much on this aspect of it, but I've seen a lot of teachers uh, start to use podcasting as part of instruction. So if we take a look back here, as you're doing some of those workshops or lectures or doing some research or reading about the content, instead of just always having like text or an in-class lecture or maybe a video, podcasts and audio is actually an increasingly used uh, resource for students. So if you think about a tool like Newzella, for instance, they actually have a lot of audio content that they bring in from like ListenWise and NPR um, so that students can access through there. Audiobooks are another option. Um, just listening to podcasts around different uh, subject areas that relate to your course, um, or if you're teaching English, like learning storytelling techniques through listening to certain podcasts. So that's one way that I think PBL could uh, in, in podcasts could be woven in here. However, what I'm going to focus on today, just because we can't cover everything, is I want to focus on the public product side of this. So although podcasts can be used for instruction, I also think the, the main in with podcasting and PBL is using a podcast as an option for students for their public product at the end of your PBL. The other thing is that there's a, an inherent authenticity to that product, right? Because they're creating something that is a viable medium. And let's face it, like podcasting and audio is, is taking off. Right. So where traditional radio, some people might think that that was dying. Because I think podcasting has reinvigorated that medium as a way that people learn, the way that people listen and communicate and collaborate with each other. So by especially if you're creating a real podcast and by the end of this session, I'm going to show you guys how students can actually create a legitimate podcast that's out there on like Spotify and Apple podcasts. And it doesn't take a whole lot of technical knowledge at all. A lot of it's all plug and play. And um, I mean, I've seen elementary schools have podcasts where the students or classes or even like maybe one for the school are publishing to those platforms. So that's going to be our main focus today. Not so much on instructing with podcasts, but on students creating podcasts as part of that public product. OK, so where does this happen now? If we think back to that um, workflow of what a PBL unit could look like. This is what I mean by that culminating event or presentation. So for instance, you would have students building a podcast. You wouldn't have them just do it right at the end. Uh, maybe you'd start by having them do some interviews or doing some initial building and creating of it and getting some feedback from others. But that culminating event, what they use to demonstrate a deeper understanding of the topics you're covering in that unit would be through the medium of a podcast. So you probably do projects like this where you'll have different um, options for them. So you can either create, you know, you can write a research paper, you can create a slide deck, you can make a movie, you can make whatever. So what I'm saying is that making audio and podcasting one of those options and making it a viable option for your students, I think is, is something that's definitely doable today, way more than it's ever been, just partly because the technology has advanced so quickly that makes it easy for students to create audio in a way that it never was easy before. So one thing to consider before you dive into this, and this is a little bit more about PBL in general, but thinking about this kind of like matrix, right? So when you start doing PBL, I highly suggest folks do kind of this top left quadrant where you maybe have everybody as their culminating activity or something that they're building towards as they go through the unit is the same product with the same target audience. 
And what I mean by that is like, say, for instance, everybody's going to make a video. Maybe they use different tools to make the video, but they're creating a video and maybe their target is uh, they're trying to advocate for a new public policy and they're going to target the community. That could be something you start with, right? So everybody's going to get started and everyone's going to make a podcast. And then you can kind of teach the different tool that you're going to use for the podcast. Now, maybe you start to branch out and you say, all right, we're all going to make like a podcast, but maybe we can use slightly different tech tools to develop that product. Um, and then as you get more comfortable and podcasting is just in your arsenal, then you can move more towards those different quadrants and say, all right, maybe some of you can make a video, some of you can make an audio story. Um, that's just one of the tools that you can use. What I don't suggest though, is starting that right off the bat, just because especially if you haven't done podcasting in the classroom before, trying to manage multiple different mediums for the projects and throwing podcasting on top, that may be a little bit tough for you to support, especially if you haven't done it before. So I would say maybe do a smaller scale project or a smaller PBL unit that would go a little bit quicker. Or even if it's not a full PBL unit, maybe you just do a quick two or three lesson um, activity where they get comfortable with the podcasting tools, which we'll get to in a second. Now, here are a couple uh, resources that if you did want to dive into this later, this is all linked into the slide deck. Um, if you joined us a little bit after the webinar started, I can uh, stick around after and share that out with you guys. But this is from The Atlantic. It's from a little while back, but they, they've done a lot of um, kind of use cases of podcasting in the classroom. This was a really interesting one regarding um, how students can use podcasting to be introduced to content. But also thinking through as you go through that article, if you get a chance to read through it, um, how this could also be used for students to use as like models, right? So if you listen to really good podcasts or you listen to good content, that can be a model for how to create a good content, right? So one thing that I truly believe about being a good writer is it's hard to be a really good writer if you're not a good reader. Like if you don't read high quality writing, it's hard to replicate that and write well yourself. So um, I actually remember this college professor once, like when people were struggling with writing and, and he was giving us critiques, he's like, find a, a really good author and just dive into that and see how they do it. Like look at their craft and model yourself after that craft. Same thing with creating podcasts and audio. I highly suggest finding some really good high quality podcasts, even if you just dissect one episode of one good podcast, and then they'll get a good idea of what makes up that podcast. Um, another resource I linked in there is actually from Ed Week. It's actually a more recent article. And it actually talks about how teachers across the country, all the way down to kindergarten, are starting to turn to podcasts as an instructional tool, uh, and then also as a tool to develop student projects. All right, so what do they actually look like? So what I've done is I've curated some examples that you guys can take a look at. And this is why I highly suggest uh, accessing this slide deck um, and getting, uh, taking a look at some of the links because all of these you can actually listen to. I'll do a couple live, but for the most part, um, they're all linked in here for you to take a look at. So this is a collection of student podcasts where the students create podca uh, created podcasts for their uh, English classes, and then they posted them. I believe most of them were hosted on SoundCloud, but you can listen to what some of those sounded like. Uh, this is just one from a school in New York City. And they went through and they created a series of podcasts um, about different projects that they were working on that impacted the local community. You can also check out, there's a, a website by, um, it's actually, I think this is hosted by ListenWise, but it's actually called the Student Podcast Podcast. Why not, right? So it's actually sponsored by Soundtrap. Some of you may be familiar with Soundtrap. It's actually a collaborative audio creation tool. Um, you can make podcasts with it, of course. Uh, but anyway, if you wanted to go in here and take a listen, um, what's nice about these episodes is that it doesn't just feature the student's podcast, but a lot of them actually interview the teacher, right? So this is from Mansfield, Massachusetts, Mansfield, Massachusetts, an elementary school there, some fifth graders that made a, uh, a podcast. You can listen to the teacher talk through how they did it, and then also um, listen to the student's podcast themselves. So this is a great resource, especially if you're new to this and want to just kind of get started with what does a student podcast sound like? Uh, the next collection is actually different styles of podcasts, right? So this is actually from a, um, a resource that a educator put together for podcasting in the classroom. And they basically said, all right, 
how, what are some examples of different styles of podcasts that we can model after that we can look at? Now, these aren't the only ones, right? But if you take a look at it, if you want to do a storytelling podcast as part of your, your PBL unit, maybe you have them listen to one or two episodes from StoryCorps, right? If you want that one that's a little bit more of like a definition or information about certain topics. Um, one that I like to show people is, well, there's a few of them. There's Malcolm Gladwell's podcast is very popular and it has a lot of like historical references. So if you're a history teacher, you could use something like that. Um, Another good one is uh, the Freakonomics podcast. Just the style of how they create that podcast is really unique, I think, and creative. So thinking through what are some podcasts that are popular that you might be familiar with. Now, I'm not necessarily saying go out and have them listen to Joe Rogan, right? Because there's different podcasts that are more appropriate than others for education. But thinking through like what are some good models that we could share with kids as a way to introduce them to podcasting, especially for students that haven't done it before. All right, so all that said, right, so we have our PBL units set up or we're starting to do some more innovative projects. We want to do podcasting. How do we actually do this? How do we create the audio? And I've separated this into two different categories. So you don't need any special audio equipment, but if you do have the opportunity to get some equipment, I have some recommendations for what I think the best ones are. Also, as far as software, you could do this with very simple, easy to use audio creation tools. But I also have some other ones that you can test out and try that are a little bit more advanced for some of your students, or if you just have kids that, that learn along the way and want to take it to the next level. All right, so here are the simplest tools for creating audio, the simplest software. If you're on a Chromebook or any other like PC and you want a really easy app, there's actually one called 123 Apps. If you just look up one, two, three apps, they have a very simple audio creation tool if you wanna just get an audio file. Now, if you wanna use just an iOS device, like I say you have some app, uh, iPads in the classroom, I actually suggest just using either the voice memo app, which is built into the software, or you can get the Voice Recorder Pro. This is a free app for iOS or Android. It just creates some nice uh, MP3 files out of audio. Now, one that has been getting a little bit more use uh, lately is called Otter. It's not designed specifically for education, but what some teachers have liked about this one is that as you speak, it creates live transcription, which could be pretty helpful, right? So if you want to create a, a transcript of your audio as you're recording it and get a text file, this actually is a web-based tool and an iOS tool, so this could be used on anything. There is a of uh, some type of limit that they set. It's one of those freemium tools. So just a heads up on that one. Here's the second tool set. Now these are a little bit more advanced, but not crazy, right? So first of all, Moat. If you haven't heard of Moat, whether you do podcasting or not, this is a super versatile app. It's been taking off. Like I haven't seen an app get adopted by teachers as fast as this since like Flipgrid. Mo is definitely a rising star in the EdTech world. It's a free app that integrates with Google and you can leave audio comments on literally anything. So if you want to think about an introduction to creating audio, what some teachers do is they could actually create like a Google slide deck, for instance, with say a beginning of the story, middle of the story, end of the story. And then you have them add audio points with Mo. So is it a full podcast? No, but it's that style and you can give them some practice in the, in the tool. Another tool that's not a full-blown um, podcast, but is closer is called Synth. That's another free platform where essentially you create a channel in Synth and students can add audio. So you can create a collaborative channel for a class or a student could just create a podcast, for instance, through the Synth platform. Now, the one I recommend if you want an actual podcast podcast that gets published and is out for the world to see, is Anchor. It is very simple and easy to use, and it automatically posts to whatever podcast platforms you want. So for instance, if you create a podcast in Anchor, or you upload your audio file to Anchor, it'll automatically go to Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, wherever you want it to go. Um, or if you want it to just be web-based, it does that too. You can just share out the link to your podcast, and you're good to go. So just as a quick recap, these are the simple tools. If you just want some audio, maybe you just share it through Google Classroom or Seesaw or something like that. This is closer to like a full-blown podcast. This anchor is the podcasting app that I recommend for a real podcast. 
This is an example, a quick example of what you would do with Moat. Um, if you're interested in more ideas from Moat, there's something called the Moat Learning Hub. You could just Google it or you could click on it here. This is an example of a template of how you might be able to build like a podcast style episode within Moat. And you can find all of these resources on the Moat Learning Hub. All right, so now that you have it, uh, we don't have a ton of time to go into all of these in detail, but this is some resources that may be helpful for planning out a podcasting project. So um, the first thing you have to consider is something I was just kind of mentioning is how public do you want this to be? If you don't want it to be public, you don't need to use a tool like Anchor, right? So for, for instance, the whole point of Anchor is to publish. And if you don't want it to be published, then don't use it, right? So just keep it internal. So if you just wanna keep it private, all you really need are something like Moat or just something like the, those audio creation tools and have them share it to you through Google Classroom or whatever your LMS is. You only really need the full-blown podcasting apps if you're gonna actually make these something that you share out with an audience. The second is what do you have available for resources, particularly audio? Who's going to publish it? Do you have students working together? And then are the students going to make and publish this or is it going to be teacher created? For younger students, a lot of times what will happen is a teacher will take the audio files that the students submit with a simple tool like a voice memo. And then the teacher might curate it all and then push it out as a podcast. And that's a very viable option that you can have a great experience with that. But as students get older or more experienced with it, start to consider just student created and published podcasts. All right, so the next uh, few slides include links to resources on uh, blueprints for creating storytelling projects. NPR has an excellent collection here. It's just, it's like a blueprint for planning. They have a lot of links to sample scripts and ways that you can design uh, your, your podcast. There's also a great resource. It's a planning doc from the New York Times. They actually have some uh, resources here. This is just a quick example of, they have a note-taking sheet where you can go through and listen to these sample segments. So they're quick, like two minute segments of different uh, podcasts, but it helps you kind of teach students how to do active listening, but also models what a uh, podcast sounds like and how they're crafted. So of course, optional resources, but those are the two main ones that I like to recommend the NPR training uh, with the resources related to that, as well as the New York Times. All right, so let's get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of the audio tools that you would actually use if you wanted to produce this with higher quality. None of this is required to make a podcast. These are all just recommendations if you wanna make it more polished or maybe you are a library media specialist or you have some pull with one and you can say, hey, can we get some of this equipment? And then you can you know, sign it out. You don't need one of these setups for every classroom, right? I mean, it'd be nice if we had it, but you don't need that because if you think about how often are your kids producing podcasts in your class? So this could be something that maybe a department gets or even a school or grade level, and then you can share some of this equipment. All right, so here are some of the things that I recommend. The first is you should invest in some type of good mic, if at all possible. I mean, a built-in mic is fine. Um, but if you want to take it to the next level, it's not going to necessarily break the bank. The one that I recommend is actually the Yeti Nano mic. I think they come in around $80 or so. Um, again, you don't need one for every kid. You just need one for a class maybe and have them share it. Uh, but something like this, they also have one called a Snowball. If you have like a music class that does some audio creation, you might have seen some of these. Uh, they actually are like a big ball and it says Yeti on it. So all of those are good. What I don't suggest, though, is buying a cheap external mic. If you're getting a, a mic for like 20 bucks, I guarantee the built-in mic on the kid's computer is better than that $20 mic. So don't even waste your money. Uh, so either just use the built-in mic on the computers or on the iPad or invest in something like a Yeti. Now, some other things that can take like a recording area to, the, to another level of quality is they have these things called adjustable arm stands. So if you do invest in a mic like this, I suggest getting one of these because one, it secures it, right? So this is actually like a C-clamp. So you can secure it to like the side of a desk or a table. The other thing is it keeps it off the ground and it keeps it off the table, right? So if you think about it, if you just put a mic on a stand like this, I mean, the realistic thing that would happen is a kid's gonna knock it over and knock it on the floor. If you knock a mic like this on the ground, it could break. So that's why I suggest if you're gonna get something like that, you may wanna spend or get have the school invest another 20 bucks or so for one of these adjustable arm stands. It keeps it off the ground, it keeps it in place. You could also think about things like a pop filter, a shock mount. Again, none of these are necessary, but 
Something that's really helpful is that's really cheap is acoustic foam panels. And it may sound kind of excessive, but these things on the top right of the screen here, they're actually really cheap. You can just get them from Amazon. And if you can actually get like Amazon boxes and put that stuff inside of the boxes, you could just put it around like a trifold poster this, um, board. You can put it in different areas of your class. Essentially what that does is that gets rid of all the ambient noise. And it's also really helpful if you have like multiple kids recording at once in a class. If you have them record in like mini like recording booths, like I said, it could be an Amazon box. It could be like a storage box with some of these foam panels. It'll actually record um, surprisingly quality audio and get rid of a lot of that background noise because that's one of the things we face is logistically how to record this stuff with other kids in the room. That for a relatively small investment can make a big difference. All right, so how do you get some free audio in the background? So one thing that's nice is that if you use something like Anchor, it has some built-in bumper music. That's the music between different clips. Uh, there's also free uh, audio resources built into YouTube. So I'm not sure if you guys have seen this, but if you go to the YouTube um, Creator Studio, as you go down, you'll actually see something called the Audio Library. There's literally thousands of free background sounds, sound effects, songs, and all of it is copyright friendly. You're not going to get flagged for using any of that audio. It's all free to use. It's all legal. Uh, because frankly, if you just take a song off the radio and put it in the back of your podcast, that's technically illegal because you didn't get the rights to use that song. Uh, so if students are creating projects, I highly suggest they use either that library or go to one of these three collections. So we have Ben Sound, Pixabay Music, and then Free Music Archive. All three of those are really good, high quality uh, music websites that are free to download and free to use in any of your podcasts. This is also good for video projects too. So if you're ever looking for background music for video projects, all of those are good as well. This is a collection from PRX. I'm not sure if you're familiar with PRX, but they're really big into podcasting and radio and they've created a nice podcaster toolbox with a ton of resources if kids really wanna dive deep into uh, creating a high quality podcast. Now, um, the other two things, I've mentioned Anchor a few times. Um, actually, no, that's the wrong. <laughs> One second, I'm gonna adjust this on the fly. This is Audacity. So a couple other tools that you can use to edit. So if you wanna edit in something like Anchor, there's built-in editing tools there. If you wanna use GarageBand, that's a great editor. And Audacity is a free editing tool that you can download, it works on a PC, it works on, um, any computer, uh, for, so for instance, if you don't have GarageBand, Audacity is a good alternative. And again, you don't need to use an editor, but if you wanted to add in a lot of background sounds, cut out the ums and the uhs, maybe change the volume, all of these tools are really good at doing that. And on this slide, I created a link to all different tutorials that you can use, uh, that students could use to learn the ins and outs of those editing tools. And then the last suggestion, which is really just kind of the cherry on top, but if they do publish their podcast, um, if you guys listen to podcasts, you know, like when you go into your podcast catcher, there will be these, these squares that pop up with the cover of the podcast. If you go to a tool like Canva and just look up podcast covers, a lot of these visual creation tools like Canva have pre-built templates. So for instance, if you go to Canva, type in podcast at the top, you'll actually see all different templates that students could customize to create their own podcast design cover. Uh, again, not necessary, but if you're gonna put it on Anchor and you're gonna push it out to Spotify or Apple or something like that, it does make sense to have a nice uh, cover image instead of like the stock one that you would get from Anchor. It just adds a little bit more of a personal touch to it and makes it look professional. All right, I covered a lot of ground here, but we are at the bottom of the hour. I am going to stick around if there are any final questions. Uh, but for those of you that, that do have to go, just one final note. Uh, we do have a conference coming up at Bentley University on November 1st. Um, it's our first in-person event in a long time, and we're really excited about it. we got an awesome uh, collection of speakers from around the country joining us. If you are interested in learning more about that, I have a link in the slide deck, or you can just go to our website, edtechteacher.org, and find out more about it. Uh, so again, I thank you guys for joining. I'm going to stop the recording now, answer any questions that you guys may have.